From San Diego to Cooperstown, an all-star Padre finally makes it into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. The flu continues its rampage in San Diego with 32 more deaths and 1,100 cases last week. Border Wall is absolutely against the core foundational values of the United States. If we get a wall like they built in uh, Israel, I probably will not have to wear a bulletproof vest along the border anymore. And it's been a year since President Trump's executive order to build a wall between the U.S. and Mexico. Where are we now? KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. California is taking issue with the federal government's recent repeal of Obama-era fracking regulations. Today, State Attorney General Javier Becerra filed a lawsuit seeking an injunction to block the repeal. He says federal officials have chosen to ignore the risks of fracking on public health and the environment. We take this action to protect the 40 million people of our great state of California against federal overreach and to insist that the rule of law be followed by everyone, including the occupant in the White House. So far, Becerra has filed more than two dozen lawsuits against the Trump administration on various issues, including the border, DACA and the travel ban. 32 more people have died locally from complications related to the flu. The county health department says still the number of cases has declined for a third week in a row. This could be an indication that the flu season is winding down. County data shows the number of confirmed cases stands at more than 13,000 for the season. Last year at this time, there were about 2,000 cases. The county is still urging people to get vaccinated as flu season can last through April. A campaign was launched today to change the way some new housing developments in San Diego's back country are approved. KPBS reporter Allison St. John says the group behind it is launching a signature gathering effort to put an initiative on the November ballot. This is the San Diego County Administration Building. It's the seat of power where the San Diego County Board of Supervisors can say yay or nay to new developments in San Diego's unincorporated backcountry. Seven years ago, the county adopted a general plan, a blueprint to guide where new housing can and cannot be built in the unincorporated areas. But Diane Coombs of San Diegans for Managed Growth says there are about 8,000 new homes in the pipeline in places that were supposed to remain rural. She says the supervisors should stick to the plan and not approve those developments. And keep the promise that we all made when it was adopted. Some of us feel betrayed uh, because, because uh, a plan is a plan is a plan, and it's good for 20 years. Coombs says voters rejected a plan to build 1,700 homes in rural Lilac Hills in 2016. Phil Pride is a former chair of the county's planning commission. He supports an initiative on the ballot that would require any new development that deviated significantly from the general plan to go to a vote of the people. And it doesn't take anything away from the supervisors. They can still say yay or nay. It's just that if they say yay, then yeah, for those developments that would fall under this, which probably won't be that many, uh, it does give the final say to the people. We are a democracy. But Matt Adams of San Diego's Building Industry Association says ballot box planning does not work well and San Diego is in the midst of a major housing shortage. All this would do would make it harder to build housing and making it harder to build housing doesn't make it cheaper to build housing, which means the society has continued to struggle with trying to meet basic housing needs. Almost 70,000 valid signatures would need to be collected by May to get the initiative on the ballot. It's called Safeguard Our San Diego Countryside. San Diegans for Managed Growth plan to use volunteers, but will also need to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars if it hopes to run a successful campaign countywide. Allison St. John, KPBS News. 
When it comes to K through 12 education, California parents have a number of options. That's the message of National School Choice Week happening now. The California Senate has declared this the week to get the word out. The state's school choice option has long been known as district choice, allowing thousands of parents across the state to enroll their children in districts in schools outside of their district. Andrew Campanella, the president of National School Choice Week, says it's all about finding the best fit. At what type of school would my child be most inspired? At what type of school would my child feel most welcomed and be most comfortable? And what are the actual schooling options available in my community? Those three questions are the ones we try to get parents to ask and hopefully start to answer as they attend events and activities and talk to different school leaders about what's out there because there are so many more options out there than ever before. About 600,000 students are enrolled in charter schools in California and close to 200,000 are being homeschooled, according to the Department of Education. Opponents say school choice increases segregation and discriminates against poor and minority families who can't drive their children across district boundaries. Well, Toys R Us announced today they're closing up to 182 stores around the country. About a dozen of those stores are in Southern California and three are in San Diego. The closures are part of the company's Chapter 11 bankruptcy reorganization plan. The company once dominated toy sales in the U.S., but has been operating under bankruptcy protection since last fall. Toys R Us was actually a big force in toy retailing in the 80s and 90s, um, but with the kind of age of Amazon and shoppers shifting more online, it's really lost its power. The stores that are closing in San Diego are in Mission Bay, Mira Mesa, and Vista. Toys R Us operates about 900 stores in the U.S. This week is San Diego Restaurant Week. It's a showcase event for the local food scene. As KPBS covers the new economy, we meet with the owner of one of the restaurants taking part to talk about cuisine, competition, and what it takes to launch a small business here in San Diego. So this is the back of the house prep area. Pepe, our yeah. numero uno prep guy. I'm Trey Fauché, I'm the owner of Galaxy Taco. When we started the restaurant, what I asked the team here was, if we were coming from Mexico, if we were operating a restaurant in Mexico, and we were opening in this location, what would we do? Because we wouldn't do what we would do in Mexico City or Oaxaca or something like that, right? We would do something that, that makes sense here. And so that's kind of the, the style of the restaurant. San Diegans are very opinionated and very um, close to their Mexican food and Mexican culture. So a lot of times when you, you have this great idea and you open, and the community really dictates what you end up being as a restaurant. And if you don't listen to it, then they'll go somewhere else. And so you kind of have to listen to that and give them uh, parts of what they're looking for and, and partly stretch them a little bit so that they, you know, that they're excited about it and it's something unique, uh, but it's still within their kind of wheelhouse. And, and I think um, if you do all those things together, you have a better chance of being successful. This is where all the masa production is done for the day. So this is the uh, Molino. We go through about 1,200 tortillas a day in this restaurant. People think of the restaurant business as you know, running a restaurant. It's running a restaurant business, you know, and, and without the business, you don't get the fun parts. You need capital. <laughs> um, you need a good, solid concept. You need um, location, location, location. Uh, you need to have a sense of the restaurant business and not just the, the fun part, the creative part. You know, you need to know what a good lease is. Um, and how to negotiate one. The trend right now is staffing. I think everybody's having an issue with staffing and that's because there's more and more restaurants opening every day and there's not necessarily the, the staff to fill them. My first job was a busboy and I was horrible at it. <laughs> um, right, right out of high school, little restaurant in Ojai, California and um, quickly learned that I was a back of the house person. It used to be that you had to really drive everywhere and now most likely you're going to find a pretty good spot in your neighborhood, which, you know, 
probably eight years ago wasn't the case. Restaurant Week is back. You know, when it's San Diego Restaurant Week or any other time of the year, it's a time to, to maybe try something that's a little different um, and, uh, and make sure that you're supporting your community. Galaxy Taco is just one of nearly 200 local restaurants participating in San Diego Restaurant Week. All locations are listed at SanDiegoRestaurantWeek.com. The city of San Diego has received a D in the latest tobacco control report card from the American Lung Association. As KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg explains, the report card finds San Diego didn't do enough to protect people from secondhand smoke. The report card grades cities and counties in three areas of tobacco control, smoke-free outdoor air, smoke-free housing, and reducing sales of tobacco products. San Diego got a B for requiring retailers to have a license to sell tobacco, but the city got poor marks for allowing people to smoke on sidewalks and at outdoor work sites. The city also fell short in its lack of restrictions on smoking in multifamily housing. The American Lung Association's Deborah Kelly says San Diego needs to take action. Because when you look at all of the data, the number one area where people are still exposed to secondhand smoke is in the home. And if you live in an apartment or a condominium and your neighbor is smoking, you're smoking too. This year's report card gave California an A for raising its tobacco tax at the ballot box. Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. The San Diego Housing Commission is getting ready for its 12th annual Homeless Resource Fair. The one-day event is a chance for people living on the streets to get a hot meal, a flu shot, and legal advice, among other services. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman has more. City of San Diego leaders gathered Wednesday asking for last-minute donations. This is likely to serve more than 1,000 homeless San Diegans, and so your donations, whether they be socks or other kinds of uh, uh, garments or issues, are in critical need. The annual resource fair is held at Golden Hall and offers free dental work, haircuts, and information about permanent housing. We need the units, we need the apartments, we need the houses, we need the places for them to live. The San Diego Housing Commission is also welcoming landlords at next week's event. If you have a property available you'd like to participate in this program, um, we can make sure that it works for you with no more financial risk for you than you would have working with the private marketplace. Last November, the Housing Commission voted to move $6.5 million earmarked for permanent housing to pay for three temporary homeless shelters. There were criticisms, as you well know, so I think that diverting the funding to get people off the streets now into the shelters was the right thing to do. The shelter run by the Alpha Project has been open for nearly two months now. We've had, I believe it's 24 uh, permanent placements to come out of that shelter into permanent housing. The 12th annual Project Homeless Connect is next Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. downtown. The Housing Commission says it is still looking for an additional 50 volunteers to help out. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Temperatures are expected to drop tonight, and we may even see some showers. Erin Calandra has more in tonight's full forecast. Well, hopefully everyone had a nice day today. Our weather was pretty nice. Taking a look around the county, satellite and radar not picking up anything because not much is happening, but that will change tomorrow. We have a cold front that is heading in our direction. With that, we're seeing widespread rain to the north of us. By the time it reaches the southwest where we are, it's really just going to be a couple of showers in places. For us, maybe some uh, brief light showers. Most people will stay dry. So 52 degrees for tonight low clouds and some fog should be expected and uh, that's how it looks across the coast here it's going to be kind of a foggy night with some clouds oceanside 44 degrees poway 42 inland of course less clouds 33 degrees in ramona and alpine coming in at 36 degrees here's that front it's going to be pushing through tomorrow and behind it well you're going to notice a change in temperatures it's going to get a lot chillier san diego a high of 62 oceanside 62 and poway 66 Ramona 62 degrees and Chula Vista coming in at 64. Again, some people could see some very light brief showers, but really widespread. It's going to stay pretty dry. Here we are Thursday, 4 o'clock in the morning, and you can see that storm pushing to the south. Clouds build overnight uh, through uh, lunchtime on Thursday. That's when we could see a few tiny brief showers. Other than that, it's really just going to be a bit on the breezy side and a bit chillier. This weekend, well, for us, it is warm 
warming up, drying out from that cold front. And you know what? By Monday, we're going to see record challenging temperatures for our highs. So we go from one extreme to another. 62 degrees on Thursday. Friday, still chilly at 62. Look at that overnight low, 39 degrees along the coast. Saturday, we rebound to 71. And look, by Monday, we're at 80 degrees. So a big jump in our temperatures. On Thursday in inland, it's going to be 66 degrees. By Monday, we're talking nearly 90 degrees with beautiful sun. In the mountains, 48 degrees Thursday, warming up to the 50s and then eventually the low 60s. And in the deserts, we start off at 71, drop down to the 60s and then jump up to the 80s. So a nice warming trend ahead of us. Ebony, back to you. One year ago, President Trump issued his executive order calling for the immediate construction of a new wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. But the controversial wall that was a hallmark of his campaign has yet to materialize. There's still no funding from Congress and the effectiveness of eight prototypes is still being evaluated. Will Trump's wall ever be built? KBBS Fronteras reporter Gene Guerrero has more. And we're going to build a wall, a wall. We're going to build a wall. President Trump promised to build, build a wall. wall. Here on this dirt patch of land in southeastern San Diego are the main products of those promises. Eight prototypes of various colors and materials. Each tower is about 30 feet high three times the height of the existing border fence just south of them. Thanks for joining CBP on what we think is an announcement to be proud of. It's been three months since they were unveiled, with the acting deputy commissioner for U.S. Customs and Border Protection, Ron Vitello, lauding their scale. The biggest impression I have is how big they are. The prototypes cost taxpayers $20 million, but it's unclear if the prototypes will ever be used because there's still no money for Mr. Trump's wall. The prospect of the wall has inspired several artistic protests, such as a billboard-sized image of a little boy peeking into the U.S. over the fence. More recently, artists projected light graffiti onto the prototypes from Mexico. One of them is Jill Holslin. The border wall is absolutely against the core foundational values of the United States. The core foundational values of the United States have been built upon immigration, upon um, welcoming, welcoming refugees, upon creating a society that's very diverse. But some continue to await the wall with hopeful anticipation. One of those people is Bob Maupin, a retired mechanic whose property touches the border in southeastern San Diego County. If we get a wall like they built in uh, Israel, I probably will not have to wear a bulletproof vest along the border anymore. He patrols his property for trespassers from Mexico. Hell yeah, I'm a vigilante, if you use the word before Hollywood got a hold of it. Because originally, vigilantes were people that were enforcing the law because of the lack of law enforcement. Along the southern edge of his property, he built a chain link fence that runs parallel to the government's border fence. He says the government fence is pretty useless because it's so easy to climb, standing only 10 feet tall here with corrugations that can be used as steps. His fence is crowned with barbed wire. Still, it often gets cut by smugglers. Maupin has patched it with bundles of chain link and metal slabs. Over the years, my wife and I have spent probably $20,000 in fence repair and property repair because of these people. Now, Maupin feels he must use himself as a barrier against illegal immigration. It is my duty to protect my country from people invading it. Further east, in the Arizona desert, another man searches for people who get lost illegally crossing the border and tries to save them. Here, it's nature that stops people from coming through. Hundreds die each year from the extreme temperatures. Often, El Ortiz recovers their bodies with the help of a group named Aguilas del Desierto, Eagles of the Desert. It's another gallon. Ortiz says the existing wall is to blame for the deaths because it has pushed migrants into the desert. El muro, pues es... The wall is a method of discrimination. It's a way of saying, you're inferior to me, and here I am, marking my territory. The United States, with its policies, how many deaths has it cost? He says a longer wall will mean more deaths. Ortiz started this rescue group after finding the body of his own brother, Rigoberto, in the Arizona desert. Rigoberto died trying to cross the border illegally in 2009. 
I lost all illusions, all ambition for having things. I stopped having desires to be somebody. I wanted to dedicate my life to helping people who suffer this. On this search, Ortiz and his group come across a stack of letters and other things that appear to have belonged to someone who died. A large stain of grease on the desert floor indicates that a corpse was recently removed from here. I love you so much, Francisco, my love. The letters appear to be from the man's girlfriend or wife. There shouldn't be a border wall. We're all human. Back in San Diego, Border Patrol agent Joshua Wilson says the wall makes it easier for agents to do their jobs. And, you know, no, no barrier is a be-all, end-all that's going to prevent all illegal activity. However, what it does is it allows us time to interdict the uh, attempt to enter the country illegally, and it, it acts as a speed bump. He says there are areas of the border that the wall doesn't address at all, such as the ocean. We've had people try and swim across, surf across, scuba dive, jet ski. Uh, there's no end to the creativity of the people trying to come here illegally. Maritime apprehension skyrocketed after the first wall was built. Smugglers also started digging tunnels under the fence and using drones. And now, government statistics show that most drug trafficking occurs through ports of entry. Experts on both sides of the political spectrum agree that even if President Trump's wall is built, smugglers won't stop finding new strategies for getting people and drugs into the U.S. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. KPBS News has examined government records of the current barriers along the border. You can find our America's Wall series online at kpbs.org. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, a doctor for USA Gymnastics is sentenced to prison after the women he assaulted stand up and speak out. That's coming up at 7 right after Evening Edition on KPBS. For the first time, researchers have used the cloning method that produced Dolly the sheep to create two healthy monkeys. AP reporter Carrie Antelfinger says this brings us a step closer to the possibility of using the method to create cloned humans. Meet Zonzon and Hua Hua. These macaque monkeys are more than just a couple of cute faces. They are the first primates cloned using the same method that made Dolly the sheep. The findings were published in this week's journal, Cell. Scientists say it's an important breakthrough, considering their close relations to humans. We've been waiting for, for this work uh, a long, long time, um, almost 20 years after Dolly the Sheep. And, uh, and I can tell you, um, sometimes the public is not aware of, of uh, how much uh, non-human primate research have helped human health, and so this, this would open the door to new therapies. Dolly the sheep was the first mammal to be cloned with DNA taken from an adult. It was announced in 1997. About two dozen mammal species have since been cloned through a similar process. These two were born genetically identical within the last eight months at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Shanghai. The cloning process begins with a monkey egg in a fetal monkey cell that has been cultured in a lab dish. Researchers remove the nucleus, which contains the DNA, from the egg. The other cell is slipped into the egg, so it replaces the egg's nucleus with its own. The egg then divides and grows into an early embryo, which is implanted in a monkey and grows to term. It took 127 eggs, of which 79 were implanted as embryos, to produce two babies. Uh, so I, I think that they did an incredible amount of, of work. Uh, there's still things that we can improve for sure. And um, this is going to be one of those seminal papers that we're going to be referring back to for many years to come. Scientist Jose Cibeli at Michigan State University says if the process becomes efficient enough in monkeys, the public could face a big ethical dilemma whether to adapt it for use in humans. Currently, mainstream scientists and ethicists generally oppose trying to make human babies from cloning, citing safety and other concerns. This, in a sense, will we'll start the conversation again about whether we want to use cloning as a way of reproduction in the future or not. So far, the baby monkeys are growing normally. The group is expecting to clone more macaque over the coming months. The Chinese researchers say clone monkeys would be useful for medical research. Carrie Antelfinger, Associated Press. 
talk about a win for San Diego. Trevor Hoffman, a former closer for the San Diego Padres, is heading to the Baseball Hall of Fame. He earned nearly 80% of votes cast by the Baseball Writers Association of America. Hoffman is the third San Diego Padre to get in the hall. Dave Winfield and Mr. Padre Tony Gwynn are the others. Today Hoffman got a phone call he isn't likely to forget anytime soon. Like I told you in Orlando, sometimes it takes a little longer than it should, but uh, uh, you're where you belong right now, my friend. Uh, I, I do appreciate that. I'm surrounded by a lot of family and friends and they've been listening to you and like everybody's pretty excited. <laughs> Last year, Hoffman was just five votes shy of making it into the Hall of Fame. He will be inducted at a ceremony in Cooperstown, New York, at the end of July. Now, here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, searching for the next big deal on the silver screen, the sights and sounds of the Sundance Film Festival. And on Midday Edition, Governor Brown's last state of the state will have reactions and analysis tomorrow on KPBS radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.